Hello, my name is Corey Pine, Corey Pine Shane. I'm the director of the Blue Ridge School of Herbal Medicine in Asheville, North Carolina. So we're here to today to talk about Pedicularis canadensis, a wonderful medicinal herb. Common names include betony, wood betony, uh, lousewort, uh, and owlhead, which is one I've never actually heard but I've read. There's also another herb called betony or wood betony uh, which is Stachys botanica. Stachys botanica is a totally different plant, also used for medicine, but uh, different uses. So just be aware when someone says they're using either the word betony or wood betony, they may be talking about Stachys botanica or they may be talking about Pedicularis canadensis. So for the sake of this video, I'm going to just use the word Pedicularis to, as the name to talk about this plant to avoid any confusion. Pedicularis canadensis is a plant that's in the Orobanchaceae family. It was previously in the figwort family, uh, Scrofulariaceae, but they moved it because it is actually a semi-parasite, meaning that even though it has green leaves and produces its own chlorophyll, it is also partially parasitic on local plants. So in harvesting this plant for medicine, it's a good thing to be aware of because if you find this plant growing next to poison ivy or within 10 feet of, of poison ivy, let's say, or um, uh, life root, golden ragwort, botanical name, used to be Senecio aureus, and currently it's been recently changed to Pacara aurea. Uh, a common plant in this, that often grows in the same area as Pedicularis, but which contains some mildly toxic chemicals. I would not harvest this plant if it's growing next to the uh, Senecio or Pacara. When I first learned about Pedicularis species, I actually learned first about Pedicularis gronlandica, which is called elephant's head betony and has purple flowers. And that grows from New Mexico into Colorado pretty abundantly. I've seen it up near, uh, up in uh, southern Montana. I've seen it in the Cascades, east of Eugene, Oregon, uh, sparsely up there, but I've seen it. Um, so that's actually, a lot of the West Coast herbalists use Pedicularis grenlandica. Us herbalists in the Southeast use Pedicularis canadensis because it's our local species. But anything I say about Pedicularis canadensis could also be applied to um, other Pedicularis species in the, in the West. I use it really specifically for skeletal muscle tension, to help relax skeletal muscle. So to explain, there's two main types of muscle in the body. There's skeletal muscle, it's also known as striated muscle, which means striped, or smooth muscle, which is also called visceral muscle because it coats it's the kind of muscle in our viscera, in other words, our internal organs. So this herb does not work so well on smooth muscle. So it wouldn't help asthma or um, a stomach cramp or a gallbladder spasm. Internal organs, it doesn't really help relax those muscles. It works for skeletal muscle. In other words, muscle that we have conscious control over. Probably one of my main uses is like a stiff, shoulders, stiff neck, uh, stiff back, if it's more of a muscle ache, more of tight, tense muscles. Uh, in that sense, I've used it for tension headaches, where um, muscle tension has led to uh, the muscles pressing against the blood vessels, and that leads to a headache. That's where we get the word tension headache. I also have used it for friends of mine who have been doing a lot of physical labor and their muscles are sore afterwards. So primarily it's, you know, and the plants don't always know what, what they're used for. Meaning that even though I primarily use it as a skeletal muscle relaxant, 
I've also heard from several women that it's actually excellent for menstrual cramps as well, uh, which of course is smooth muscle. And so it kind of goes against what I just said, but uh, maybe it works because it relaxes the stomach muscles around that area, the zoas, the other muscles that kind of cross through this area, and therefore by reflex relaxes the uterine muscles as well. And I find that it really works on the peripheral nervous system, not the central nervous system. What I mean is that it doesn't seem to me to affect consciousness. It seems that when I take this herb, my muscles relax. It seems to work out here in the meat of the body and not so much in the brain or spinal cord. I still think clearly. It doesn't seem to affect my mental clarity or cognition at all. It seems to be primarily uh, relaxing the muscles, the neuro, I think of it as working on the neuromuscular junction, which is really just a fancy way of saying where the nerves meet the muscles. So it works out, seems to work out here and not so much in here. Whereas an herb that is not local here, kava kava, I think primarily works in the central nervous system and relaxes the brain and therefore relaxes the body. Particularis relaxes the body and therefore might relax the brain. So there's the difference, you know, is the cause more like happening out here in the muscle or is it more um, happening as a result of anxiety and the anxiety is making us tense up? And really, it could probably work either way. I mean, if you're emotionally anxious and you get a massage, it's not working on the brain, it's working on the body, but it relaxes our mind. So the same way, Pedicularis relaxes our body and could therefore relax our mind. I know a chiropractor in Arizona who gives it to his clients before an adjustment because it helps relax the muscles around the spine so that when he does the adjustment, um, the adjustment holds a little bit longer. The tight muscles don't pull the spine right back out of place. So another use of particularis is for uh, unconscious armoring. In other words, people who hold their body tense and tight as a way of guarding against the world. Particularis could be part of a protocol you could use to help someone relax that armoring so they could feel into their body more and work through that past trauma. Particularis won't heal the trauma, but it's a tool you can use to help someone access their bodies more and therefore help process that trauma. So the three main ways that people take herbs in the U.S. are either a tincture, it's another name for an alcohol extract. Uh, a capsule, the dried herb, ground and powdered and put into uh, a capsule. Uh, or as a tea, a water extract, which technically we might call infusion or decoction. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to simplify and just use the word tea. This herb is not available, as far as I've seen, as a capsule. It's not a widely used herb yet the Pedicularis canadensis or the Pedicularis grunlandica. I feel like it was a folkloric herb. It was an herb that was used a lot um, in home practice, but it was not written about in herb books. You're gonna have a hard time finding this herb if you go into herb books to look it up, unless you find the books of like Michael Moore, for example, who I believe, as far as I know, is the one who really brought Pedicularis into modern herbal practice. David Winston talks about how uh, the Cherokee people have used Pedicularis for some of the same uses that uh, we currently use it for. In other words, for helping relax tight, tense muscles, or I believe he also talked about using it for, um, for bruises and bangs and, and such like. And the primary way that I use it, and that a lot of herbalists use it, is as a tincture. So personally, I tincture it fresh, one to two, weight to volume, one part weight, two parts volume at 95% alcohol. I know people who have dried it and used it as tea. I know also know folks who have dried it and made it into a smoke. You know, dried it, crumbled it up, and then rolled it in uh, rolling papers and smoke it as a nice relaxing herb. So the main way that I use Pedicularis externally is as an infused oil, meaning that I would harvest a fresh plant and put it in, chop it up, put it in a jar, and cover it with a fixed oil. In other words, like a vegetable oil, one of my favorites being extra virgin olive oil. 
You could also use raw sesame oil, not toasted, but raw sesame oil specifically. They're very different. And uh, I would let the herbs sit in that oil for a few weeks, up to a month, in a warm place. And then at the end of that time, strain it out and keep the oil, compost the herb, and that oil is what you would use topically. I would take that infused oil, now that it's been sitting for a month, and we've strained it out, and I would put it on an area that was uh, tight or tense, or even like bruised and sore, and I would like rub it in that area, and uh, it just really helps relax the muscles. So that's the main way I use it topically. I guess you could add a little bit of beeswax, melt beeswax in there, make it into a salve, I've never used it that way. It seems like that could be a good way to do it. So if you do do that, then uh, email me and let me know so I know that I can try that. Uh, we're always learning and growing. I never learned about this herb, for example, as a topical remedy. And one day I decided, you know, if it's such a good muscle relaxant, I bet I could use this topically as well. And so I went home after harvesting one day, made some tincture, and I just took some and made it into a, to an oil as well. And I tried that on myself. One of my rules, always try a medicine on yourself before you give it to any client, friend, family, whatever. So always try things on yourself first. Um, you can be your own guinea pigs that way. And, uh, and it seemed to help. It seemed to like really work. So now I've started using it with some clients as well. Dosage. Dosage of the tincture, the alcohol extract, is I would take uh, about two squirts of the tincture in a couple ounces of water. You could dilute it more, but that dilutes the medicine a little bit and uh, also makes the taste last longer. So typically I tell my clients and customers, you know, put your tincture in just a little bit of water, a couple ounces of water dilutes some of the alcohol flavor, makes it easier to take. You could also take it just directly in the mouth. I've heard some reports of people taking pedicularis and feeling like their reflexes were slow a little bit. Just slowed like maybe like a couple milliseconds, which is not a big deal unless you're driving on the highway where you want your reflexes to be sharp. If you have a really bad, tight, tense muscles, you could take that every two hours. You could take that dosage, two to five dropperfuls, every two hours if you need to. I would like to start low and titrate up. Start low and then see what dose works for you. And it takes about 10 or 15 minutes after you take the dose to really feel the effect of the medicine. Cautioning you because if you take five dropper foals, you're like, wait, it hasn't worked yet. Wait 15 minutes, see how it is before you take any more. So let's talk about how to wildcraft this plant. Wildcraft means to harvest from the wild as opposed to harvesting from our garden or buying it in this store. The first thing I would think about is how much is there because we want to harvest in a sustainable way. We harvest medicine from the wild to take care of human beings or other animals that we're taking care of, uh, but we also do it with consciousness about where we're harvesting. We want to harvest from a place where we're not going to impact the, the wild area overly much. So the first thing I do when I go out to harvest any plant is I'll do a stand count. I'll walk around and see okay, how many plants are here. Where are those plants? Are there more plants uphill or more plants downhill? Are there more plants in the sun, more plants in the shade? Um, this helps you kind of get to know the plant better so you know where to look for it next time. But it also gets you aware of uh, where is the stand strongest, where is the stand kind of petering out, or where is the stand just coming into, perhaps. So this tends to be a stand plant. In other words, if you find, you typically don't find just one particularis, typically you find a bunch of particularis in one place. So I would harvest from an area where there's hundreds of this plant and I would go through. The part used is both the flower heads such as these and then also the fresh leaves. So I would 
Typically, I would like pick a few fresh leaves. I would come down here, pick a few of these basil leaves. They look very fern-like. And if you find these at a time of year when it's not flowering, you might almost think that that's a fern. But the midleaf is a little bit longer. And of course, as a flower, ferns don't have flowers. And even after this flowers, you might still see the skeleton of the flower, the seed head, might still be there for months afterwards. So what I would probably do is pick a, leaf, pick a few leaves here and there. I tend to pick the larger leaves because there's always going to be a few smaller leaves that are going to come up and take its place. And then I would probably pick a flower head like so. Pick a few of these flower heads and then put that in the medicine so I'd have maybe half leaves, half flowers, blend those together, chop them up a little bit, and then make that into medicine. And as we mentioned before, I would also be careful about where this plant is growing, what it's growing next to. Because if it's growing next to a um, Senecio, golden ragwort, which is a yellow flowering plant in the uh, sunflower or dandelion family, it might have some of those toxic chemicals in there. So just be aware of where you're harvesting it as far as interplant interactions. Be aware of where you're harvesting it in terms of uh, what, what kind of area you're harvesting from, and just spread out your harvesting. In other words, you might harvest from this plant right here, and then maybe from the plant next to it, and then you might walk five or ten feet away, walking over like two or three patches of, two or three small patches of particularis, and then start harvesting again. And I like to spread out my harvesting so no one plant is overly impacted by my harvest but every plant takes just a little bit. Take a little bit from each plant, and that way the plant, this individual plant, like this flower can still pollinate, these leaves can still grow, the roots will still be here next year. And uh, yeah, we don't have an over much impact in any one place. So that's a little bit about the medicinal plant, Particularis canadensis, sometimes called betony or wood betony. Um, yeah, hope you find this information useful and uh, hope you get a chance to use this plant to help you relax, relieve stress, and have a more peaceful and easy life.